Let's look at a nice problem that was shortlisted for the 2007 International Math Olympiad. So I think this is kind of a tricky one. So let's suppose that we've got an arbitrary real number, which we'll call a sub zero, and then we'll recursively define this sequence a sub n via the recursion a n plus one equals the floor of a n times the fractional part of a n. So I think that's a pretty cool definition for a sequence. And then our goal is to show that at some point, that sequence, well, it doesn't become fixed, but it becomes almost fixed. It, in fact, has a period of two. So in other words, we've got a natural number n, so that if n is bigger than or equal to n, then a n plus two is equal to a n. So for example, if that capital N was equal to 10, then that means that a 10 would be equal to a 12, which is equal to a 14, which is equal to a 16, and so on and so forth. And then A11 would be the same as A13, which is the same as A15. And then I think you can see where we're going here. And just as a reminder, I said this was the floor and this was a fractional part, but the floor is like an elevator down to the closest integer. So the floor of 2.35 is two. And well, I think the fractional part is well named. So the fractional part of 2.35 is 0.35. Now let's notice for any real number X, x is equal to the floor of x plus the fractional part of x. Furthermore, that fractional part is always a number between 0 and 1. It can never be equal to 1, but it can be equal to 0. And the floor is always an integer. Okay, so let's maybe start with a little bit of exploration. So let's maybe look at the first case if a is in the interval from 0 to 1. So we're going to basically assume that a naught is always not an integer because if a naught is an integer, then the fractional part is going to be equal to zero. But if the fractional part is equal to zero, then that means everything else will be equal to zero from that point forwards. So here we've got a number between zero and one. But let's note that means that a sub one, which is the floor of a naught, times the fractional part of a naught is equal to zero times a naught, which is equal to zero. Notice the floor is equal to zero. The fractional part is equal to itself, given that we're between zero and one. But notice if a one is equal to zero, well, then that means that a two, a three, and actually all of the other terms of the sequence are also equal to zero. Okay, well, let's look at the next, maybe, case of our exploration. And let's say, well, what happens if a naught is inside of the interval, maybe from two to three? I'll skip from one to two. Just, you can fill that in if you want to. So if a naught is between two and three, then that means that a one, well, that's gonna be, again, I'll just write it down, the floor of a naught, the fractional part of a naught, but now the floor of a naught is equal to two. And then this fractional part, I'll just write as the fractional part. But now let's observe that that fractional part is gonna be between zero and one always. We're assuming this is not an integer, so it will not be equal to zero. So that means that this is on the interval from zero to two. But now we can rewrite this as the interval from zero to one union the interval from one to two. I think that's pretty clear. But now observe that if a naught lands in the interval from zero to one, then we're good. If it lands in the interval from one to two, well, then we're also gonna be good. So notice if a1, let's, let's just write that out. If it's in zero to one, then that means that a2 equals a3 equals dot, dot, dot equals zero. So everything two and above will give us zero. So on the other hand, if a1 is on the interval from one to two, actually let's maybe split this up a slightly different way. We'll put the bracket on the one there. 
notice that we could have the potentiality of landing on one because this fractional part could be equal to a half. Okay, so anyway, if A1 is on the interval from one to two, well, that was that little homework exercise that I said to do, but let's just work it out. So this means that A2, well, that's gonna be equal to the floor of A1, which is one, times the fractional part of A1. So that's gonna land us inside of the interval from uh, zero to one. But if that lands us in the interval from zero to one, then that means that A sub three will be equal to zero. But then from there, it follows that A sub n is equal to zero for all n bigger than or equal to three. So in other words, not only do we just have this two period, we actually have a one period. It looks like what's going on here is if we start with a positive number, then we in fact end up with zero eventually. So let's prove that carefully and then we'll move on to see what happens to a negative number. Okay, so here's what we ended up seeing via our exploration on the last board. So it seemed like if we started with a non-negative real number, then eventually the sequence was always equal to zero. So let's see how this might go. So if a naught is a non-zero real number, well, then that means that A naught will really be on the interval from zero to capital N. Because, of course, we can find a natural number bigger than any real number. That's what we're doing here. Okay, but now let's observe that A1 here will be equal to the floor of A naught times, let's see, the fractional part of A naught. But now, well, let's split this up. Let's split this up into the interval from zero to n, not including n, union that top point n. So if it's this top point n, then this is most definitely equal to zero and we're done. If it's this lower thing right here, then that means the floor is between zero and n minus one, which means that a sub one is between zero and n minus one. But either way you look at that, a sub one will be between zero and n minus one. So this is on the interval from zero to n minus one by that argument that we just said verbally. But then now we can continue this. Now we've got a two, well, that's gonna be on the interval from zero to n minus two. And then we've got a three, well, that's gonna be on the interval from zero to n minus three. And then, well, it continues on, and we could maybe technically do this with induction, but we've got a more sizable induction proof for the other case, so we won't do that here. But what we end up seeing is that A sub capital N minus one, well, that's gonna be on the interval from zero to one. But what does that tell us? That tells us that A sub capital N is equal to zero. But in turn, that means that A sub little n is equal to zero for all n bigger than or equal to capital N. And we're done with this case. So that means we need to move on to the case where we started with a negative real number. Okay, so we just finished proving that our statement holds if we started with a non-negative real number. Now we're going to see that our statement also holds if we start with a negative real number. And we're going to prove this by induction. So if we start with a negative real number, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that a naught must be on the interval from minus n to zero. Well, of course, we can always find a negative integer that's smaller than any negative real number. So like I said, we're gonna do this by induction and let's just point out we're doing this by induction on this number that we're calling capital N right here. Okay, so well, if we're doing something by induction, we need a base case. And I think the base case is pretty clear that that's gonna be any number between negative one and zero. So here we've got a naught is on the interval from minus one to zero. And then maybe I'll just point out right here
that let's take a naught not to be equal to minus one because observe that it's if it's equal to minus one then immediately we get zero because the fractional part of that is equal to zero okay so now well what can we do let's observe that a1 will be equal to the floor of a naught times the fractional part of a naught but now notice that the floor of a naught is equal to negative one here and then well, what's the fractional part of a naught? Well, in fact, by this formula over here, the fractional part is in fact gonna be equal to a naught plus one, which observe that since a naught is between negative one and zero, well then a naught plus one is between zero and one, and then if you negate that, you land back into something between negative one and zero. Remember, we're assuming that this is not equal to negative one here. Okay, well now let's calculate A2. So A2, well that's gonna be the floor of A1 and then the fractional part of A1. But now that's gonna be equal to negative one again. And then, well, we can apply the same formula we did up here for the fractional part of A0. So that's gonna be equal to A1 plus one. But now let's observe that that's negative A1 minus one. But then notice that a1 was equal to negative a0 minus 1. So putting this all together, we'll see that it all simplifies down to a0. So we have a2 is equal to a0. And then similarly, it'll follow that a3 is equal to a1 and a4 is equal to a2, which is equal to a6 and so on and so forth. And then this is also equal to a5. So there we have it. We have our two periodic sequence immediately. Okay, so we've got our base case sorted. Now let's move on to our induction step. Okay, so now we're ready for our induction hypothesis and to proceed with our induction step. So let's suppose that we've got some k so that if a naught starts in the interval one minus k to zero, then the statement holds. In other words, we can do this kind of stuff over here with a two period of our sequence. And now for our induction step, let's suppose that a naught, well, is in the interval from minus k to zero. But now let's observe that we can decompose this into the interval minus k to one minus k union, the interval from one minus k to zero. And then, well, over here, in other words, if a naught is on that bit of the interval, then we're done. So if here, we're done by the induction hypothesis. Or, well, if it lands on that one minus k, it's by the fact that we're already at an integer. So that means we might as well only look at the case when a naught is on the interval from minus k to one minus k. Okay, so now let's calculate a1. So a1 will be equal to the floor of a naught, which is minus k, times the fractional part of a naught. But now that fractional part is between zero and one. So the fact that the fractional part is between zero and one, that means that this lands back in this interval right here. So that means it lands on the interval from minus k to one minus k union one minus k to zero. I'm using that same decomposition again. So if you recall before in the positive case, doing our maybe sequence construction rule, we always like decrease the value of the sequence cascading down through these intervals that were capped off by integers. But in this case, we don't do that. We land back in the same interval, which is what makes this tricky. Okay, so now let's notice that if we're here, then we're done again by the induction hypothesis. But note that we can keep applying our rule again and again and again. And what we'll see is that for all m bigger than or equal to zero, 
we have a sub m is on this interval from minus k to one minus k union minus or one minus k to zero. And again, if any of these land on this second interval from one minus k to zero, then we're done. So in other words, if there exists a capital M such that A sub capital M is here, then the induction hypothesis implies that we're done. So, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that really what we need to look at is the bad case. So in other words, we wanna look at the case when we know that A sub M is on the interval from minus K to one minus K for all M bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so, well, let's do that. Okay, so we just motivated that we really need to look at the case where all of our values of our sequence land in the interval from minus k to one minus k. Otherwise, you know, like I said before, we were done by the induction hypothesis. Okay, well, let's see what we can do from this. Okay, so if this is holding for all m, then we could do the following trick. So notice that a sub m plus one is equal to, well, the floor of a sub m plus one, which is minus k, times the fractional part of a sub m. But now this a sub m plus one, recall that that is on the interval from minus k to one minus k. So that means that we could maybe squeeze this interval by this minus k and we get like a range for this uh, fractional part of a sub m. So let's write that over here. So this range for a sub m is equivalent to saying that the fractional part of a sub m comes from the interval from k minus one over k. Again, that's equivalent to the same that we had and that's just from like scaling the interval over here that we know that this is a part of. Okay, so the next little thing that we wanna do is get a recursion for the fractional part. So let's see if we can do that. So let's observe that we have the fractional part of a sub m. Well, that's gonna be equal to, well, notice it's a sub m minus the floor of a sub m. So let's write it like that. We've got a sub m minus the floor of a sub m, but observe that the floor of a sub m was simply equal to minus k. So this is gonna turn into k plus a sub m after like canceling minus signs. But now we can write that a sub m using the recursion. So that's gonna be k plus the floor of a sub m times the fractional part of a sub m. The floor of a sub m minus one times the fractional part of a sub m minus one. But of course we know the floor of a sub m minus one is equal to k by our assumption right here. So that gives us this one step recursion. So the fractional part of a sub m is in fact equal to k minus k times the fractional part of a m minus one. And then we can in fact carry this recursion all the way, what I'll call down to the ground. That's to the spot where we hit a sub zero and we get the following expression. So this is gonna be k minus k squared plus k cubed minus k to the fourth plus dot 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 and then we have plus minus one to the m plus one times k to the m and then plus minus one to the m times k to the m times the floor of a sub zero sorry the fractional part of these a sub zero so that means that the fractional part of a sub m can be expressed via this nice formula in terms of the fractional part of a sub zero. And now I'd like to observe that this bit that I'm underlining in yellow is in fact a finite geometric series. And there's a nice formula for the sum of a finite geometric series. And in this case, we end up with the following expression. So it'll be minus k times 
we've got minus one to the m times k minus one over k plus one. So that's how we can express that right there. Okay, so now let's bring that expression up and see where we can take it. Okay, so this is where we just landed, this nice expression for the fractional part of a sub m in terms of the fractional part of a naught. And now from here what we'll do is solve this for a naught, which isn't too hard. I guess I should say the fractional part of a naught. So solving this for the fractional part of a naught will end up with the following expression. So we'll have minus one to the m over k to the m times the fractional part of a sub m. Okay, and then we'll have plus k over k plus one. So let's see, that comes from the cancellation of this minus one to the m times k that's in the numerator of that fraction. And then we've got everything that's left over. So that'll be plus a minus one to the m plus one over k to the m minus one. And so that comes from this k right here, or sorry, this k right here canceling with the k to the m, but then we're still left with a one over k plus one. Okay, nice. And recall that k was fixed, but now let's observe that the fractional part, this number right here is always between zero and one. So if we take m to infinity, a lot of this stuff simplifies. That's exactly what we wanna do. So let m approach infinity and observe that, well, this is just gonna be between zero and one, but this k to the m in the denominator will like eventually go to zero or make this whole term go to zero. And that's because the value of k that we need here for our induction hypothesis, I didn't write this before, but it's in fact bigger than or equal to two. Okay, so this bit goes to zero. Likewise, this bit over here goes to zero and left with k, when we're left with k over k plus one. Okay, but what does that mean? Well, we've got a sub naught is equal to k over k plus one. And then likewise, if you plug that into our equation for a sub m in terms of a naught, we'll have the fractional part of a sub m is also equal to k over k plus one. And that's gonna be true for all m bigger than or equal to zero. But then recall that the floor of a sub m was always equal to negative k. But then using our formula over here that x is the floor plus the fractional part, we'll have a sub m is always equal to minus k plus k over k plus one. And like I said, this is for all m bigger than or equal to zero. So there we have it. In this case, we don't have this two period. We in fact have a fixed sequence, well, from the very beginning. And that's because we only ended up with a two period in these cases that were covered by the induction hypothesis. And that's a good place to stop.